Hey everybody, Edo here, and I am excited this morning because I have Scott Rogers on the line. Say hello, Scott. Hello, everybody. Hello. And uh, Scott uh, is a designer, a board game and video game designer, uh, in particular recently Alien, the Nostromo, uh, Pantone the Game, and Ray Guns and Rocket Ships on the board game side, and uh, like a plethora on the, uh, is that the right word, uh, numerous on, on the video game side. Plethora, um, plethora, plethora is fine, Hefe. <laughs> <laughs> but um, actually, recently we're connected because you wrote on your blog a nice little write up on the 15 steps to making and selling board games. And so it seemed like a, a cool thing to talk about. Um, yeah. So why don't you, you know, in your own words, maybe give a, a little bit of an introduction to your role, your rolling into board game space um, from the video game space or however you think of it. And then we can dive into the 15 steps. Sure. So um, my background, like you said, is has been in video games for a very long time. And I found myself in a situation, mostly due to health issues, uh, where I was on kind of a, a break. Essentially, I was recovering from chemotherapy from cancer. Oh, and, and I um, had a game idea, a video game idea that I'd been pitching around, but I couldn't get anyone to make it, mainly because, as you know, um, video games are expensive. They require a lot of people. I'm not a programmer by trade. I'm a game designer. So... I'm not, you know, I'm not the one to write code. And I was thinking about, I really like this idea. How can I get it made? And and I kind of had a, a bit of a moment where I thought, oh, I can make it as a board game because I kind of don't need anyone else to help me make it. I can make it all by myself. Uh, whenever, um, whenever talking to, uh, whenever folks in video games ask me about board games, I typically say, you don't need engineers. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that's that's very freeing, and it's also very inexpensive. Uh, yeah. Pardon me. So, um, so I I made this game called Ray Guns and Rocket Ships, and I pitched it around at Gen Con because I had always heard that Gen Con was the show to go to 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 sell a game. And I took a whole bunch of interviews. I think it was like thirteen uh, uh, pitches. And um, eventually, a, a publisher, IDW Games, uh, licensed the game from me. And they published it uh, in 2017. And I had so much fun. I really enjoyed the process. I, I always have loved board games, but I particularly fell in love with the process of making games. Right. And um, so I, just like any other game designer, I had a million other ideas for games. And and the one that kind of bubbled up that, that got bought next was a little party game uh, that became Pantone the game uh, through Cryptozoic Entertainment. Uh, and then... Um, Recently, thanks to uh, a great relationship that I have with uh, some people at Ravensburger, uh, I was able to pitch uh, an idea for Alien Fate of the Nostromo, and that came out last summer. And it's been doing nice, you know, it's it's getting a lot of attention, and, and I hear it's been selling out at, at different stores. And, uh, and, you know, my goal is, I, you know, granted, like most game designers, I still have to work my day job. Uh, but board games for me is what I call my jobby. It's my hobby that's a job uh, sure. because uh, making board games is not anything you can do lightly. It takes a lot of work and effort. Now I am I am art, familiar with that term. Yeah, well, but you you've decided to go one further because you're a publisher, and that's uh, we we recently talked about the hats of game design, right? All the different hats you wear, right? Game designer and graphic designer, and it, uh, most, uh, he said, well, you know, I've got the most hats because I'm a publisher. And I said, yeah, Gil, that's a top hat on top of a top hat on top of a top hat. <laughs> so yeah, it, that's it, probably it, what you're wearing as well, Edo. Yeah. You've got yeah. three top hats. On. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> no, it, it adds to the fun. But so, OK, so you're you, you know, you've been doing this and, and you know, these these ha have been progressively bigger and bigger splashes of board games. So I, I'm looking forward to the yeah. next stuff coming from you and actually oh, we, we could have a whole big conversation about like some interesting aspects of working with different ips and game design but that's not no. this video this video oh, no. next one. um next one this video is about um this article and and so it, it seemed to me I, I thought the the best thing to do would actually just be for the benefit of everyone watching just to walk through um sure. these different steps as, as you've put it together uh, I'll link the blog, the actual your actual blog, uh, Mr. Boss's design layer in the the description. But 
why don't we we dive right in? Uh, and and it sure. looks like you start with uh, ideation as step one. Yeah. So it's funny. The image that's on that blog post is friend uh, Andy Ashcraft's handwriting. Oh. Uh, and that we were it. ideating. We were ideating some uh, ideas on our drive up to uh, Protospiel in San Jose. Uh, we were talking about a game idea, and so I just gave him my notebook and said, "Start writing stuff down." And I, we kind of rattled off ideas uh, for a uh, kind of a farmer uh, uh, worker placement type game yeah, that I'm needs, still noodling needs, around with. Yeah, it needs barbecue sauce and ice cream. Looking at that, but uh, yeah, and actually, absolutely. A- Andy's a fantastic guy. I think probably where we we first met. That might have been that protospiel, yep. depending on the timing. Um, yeah, he, I think so. I've I've worked with him on a number of, of titles over the years, both in video games and in in board games. But he, he's super. Oh, cool I can't dude. wait for your guys' next one because it, I played it a lot and I really like it. It has. Uh, you're you're referring to codename Time Empire, but that is yes. it is it is it is that is one of the longer tailed titles, but. We've we've secured uh, art and graphic design and 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 it will be in full development in 2022. Hopefully. Well, it make it takes it takes a lot of time to make a time travel game. I hear. It does. It does. It, it'll feel like we'll just make it so it feels like it never happened. We'll just it, it'll happen it's today. A, we'll, a, we'll have a matter of fact, we'll go, I, think, I think I have a copy on my shelf right now. Yeah, it's just, yeah, yeah. I don't we'll know how go it got back. there, but there it that, is. That, yeah, <laughs> just, ha- just hand it hand so, it back to the people at the beginning. But ideation. So, talking so about it. just to so yeah, ideation. So, so just a, a little bit of preface for this whole thing is this is actually a blog post that took me a little while to put together, and I'm very much a list person, as the list on this uh, on this blog shows. Um, and and as an educator, I, I, um, I teach at the New York Film Academy and, and USC. I do game design, and so part of the the job or it, to do it well is to be able to communicate kind of big ideas very quickly and, and in a compressed format. And so I've gotten moderately good at doing that. I've written a couple of books as well as about game design. And so um, I wanted to not just talk, everybody always talks about like these steps to make a game, but I wanted to go further into the selling part because that's an area that people sometimes don't cover as well. And so uh, I was trying to look at it as the complete package. You know, the moment you get kind of your, your galaxy brain idea for a game, uh, to the point where it's something that is a material possession on a shelf. So that's that's really what this list encompasses. So ideation is, for me, it just is playing a game of getting out as many words and as many ideas and, and preferably uh, action words, verbs, um, to help guide the direction of the play, um, what, the, what the player is going to be doing. So the list that's on there is kind of like, uh, resources or or things that could be in like a farming game or something like that. But really, for me, it this is where I find the most fun is doing the research, right? Becoming a, a minor subject expert on something to the point where uh, you have more material than you really need for the product. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, for a lot of people, this is a uh, fun part, right? If you, you know, there's so many historical games out there that I'm sure that if we were to ask uh, you know, any of the creators about that topic, they could rattle off way more than what's represented in the game. Uh, and that's good. It's always better to have more ideas than than you actually end up using. Yeah, I think ideation is often a, a very fun phase. You know, the the in- interesting thing for me, like a, a phase zero, I would I would add or step zero rather would be <clears throat> inspiration for me. A big step in going into a, going into any product typically comes from like where did the spark come from that leads to that ideation phase? And it, it can be from lots of different places, right? Sometimes it's a mechanic or a time in history or, or a conversation with a friend or, or wanting to work with somebody or piece of art, right? All those things can then lead into this phase. Um, but yeah, yeah. Lists, lists are good. Writing things down are good. Like, it's easy to talk through ideation, but later on you'll, you'll, appreciate, you'll appreciate it if you wrote down what you were thinking uh, as yeah, you were I'm, brainstorming. I'm, I'm, I'm famously known or maybe infamously known for having a, a notebook with me at all times. And so this is just one of them. It's Scott's book of great ideas. And this one is volume 44. I, I have seen, I have volume. seen the, I have seen these notebooks. I have seen these. Yeah. Notebooks. Yeah. There's a whole, maybe upon my death, my wife will benefit from uh, selling them as a, as a collected set or something like <laughs> that. But, um, 
<laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, I never I honestly I've gotten into the habit of just carrying a notebook with me wherever I go. And and because you never know when an inspiration is going to strike. You know, like you said, there's a lot of great ways that can happen. My, my personal favorite is to misinterpret something. Uh, often I will go on to Board Game Geek and just kind of scroll through their image gallery and I'll look at something. And it literally just happened to me this morning. I I saw somebody's like an image that somebody had. Uh, put up of their prototype and I went oh that's interesting looking prototype and I and I read a tiny burst of description of what their game was about and I immediately in my head went oh it must be this type of game and then I read more about it and I went nope I'm completely wrong it's it's not that at all but then I went well maybe the first the misconception that I had might make for a cool game idea so it's gonna go in the notebook and and I'll explore it and we'll see if it if it works or not yeah, uh, a very old boss and mentor of mine, Andrew Leaker, um, had a mountain of, of uh, you know, like like cabinets of old ideas. He doesn't do the notebook thing so much as just tuck away printed old ideas. Um, and he, he taught me a long time ago that, like, ideas are always valuable and the idea for today might be the solution for tomorrow. And, and you know, the amount of times he would just be in a situation be like you know what i think i got something and like rattling back and finding something from 20 years ago and being like this is a perfect for that um i, I think there's something to that um we do have it's, 15 it's steps, hard but. not to be a hoarder of ideas you have to be that because they can get very overwhelming and you feel like you're not getting anything done sure, but conversely sure. i remember um when i was working for disney engineering i found out that the concept for the buzz Astro Blasters ride, the one with the laser thing that was actually designed when the movie The Black Hole came out. And they so they sat on that idea for like 10, 15 years. And and to me, that that taught me a nice little lesson of eventually good ideas get used. Eventually, um, you'll find a place for a good idea. Uh, so uh, I in the past, I used to throw out prototypes. I famously threw out a a really good working prototype that I had kind of out of frustration and i literally spent like 10 15 years trying to recreate it and and kind of unsuccessfully in my opinion and and so i between those two lessons i've learned uh don't get rid of ideas keep yeah, hang and, on to them put them so safe and, and and the only thing i would add there and and we are getting a little choppy so let's see how it goes but um the only thing i'd add is i think you can use that putting it into the notebook putting it into the box as a way to hoard it, but separate it out, right? Like you're like, cool, it's there, it's gone, but it's but I still have right. it, but I don't have to like keep it in my mind space. Let's keep rolling. So um, step two, you have is assemble. Yeah. So this again, another fun step. Uh, I in that ideation phase, I will draw out kind of like a little blueprint of what I think should be in the game. So then I start collecting the pieces for it, and I, I like most game designers have a pretty robust cabinet of bits. Uh, so I've got, you know, tokens and dice and paper and and you name it, all types of gigas. And I uh, then I put them together and I kind of spread them out in front of me and I, I kind of look at it. And the first question I always ask is not, is this a game, but is this just a thing? Is this a thing that can hold together? Does it make sense? Do the pieces seem to tell uh, the person who's looking at it uh, what to do with them? Right. It's it's kind of like the. Uh, uh, what's the the book about the affordances? I always forget the name of it, but um, uh, there's a famous uh, book about a why do door that handles the way why do two oh, pots oh, go the by, way they uh, go? Not, not not by design. It's um, maybe it's something of by everyday design. things. A design of everyday things. Yeah, it's something like that. Everyday something design. Like that, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Sure. So so that's kind of a similar idea where you look at the parts and you see if you can understand what to do with them. And then once, to me, it kind of tells a little bit of the story or at least informs how they're meant to be manipulated and interacted, then I kind of move forward with the gameplay from there. Got it. Yeah, I, I think it can be a fun uh, a fun phase. And I think there is a little bit of that ideation where you can, you know, uh, uh, ultimately you're going to be editing down from here or adding right. more, but this isn't going to be your last set of stuff. Um, but then, you know, rapidly, and I, I think this is, I, I actually like calling this out because I don't think people call it out explicitly. Your step three is solo play testing. And, you know, again, this is something that I, you know, I know most designers do. 
it literally it's not a solo game necessarily it's when you're playing your multiplayer design but you're like playing all the different you know hands right. um yeah yeah so uh any any other thoughts on that i just like that you called it out explicitly but um yeah well it, it's a very necessary step even if you do it just a few times it it helps you understand the core system loop of the game like you know what is the, what i call the order of operations which is you know what do players do when and and it also helps you understand what something that i call handiness which is the way that the players manipulate the elements of the game. So, you know, how a, a human hand, for the most part, depending on the game, of course, but for the most part, like a human hand can really only handle a hand of like three to seven cards. And then once you get past that, it starts getting kind of, you know, all over the place, right? And so the some of the things that I learned from the solo play testing is like, you know, when do I pick up something and set something else down? Where do I put it in front of me? It's almost like, uh, setting a, um, a place setting at a dinner table, right? Where everything has its place, where it lives on the table. And so this helps me determine that placement. And and I think the two, two notes I would add. One, in terms of the, the handiness you were talking about, more and more over uh, the pandemic, folks have been using Tabletopia or Tabletop Simulator to do things. And I think that's great. It's a great way to play test and move in that direction. One thing, and this is even a problem, um, uh, we've come up, uh, I've had to deal with some play testing is, you know, you like, you'll get to a play, a place on tabletop simulator where you're like, you've got a hand of 12 cards or 15 cards. And on, in, on the simulator, it's like, this isn't the problem at all, but you need to stop and be like, right. as a player, this would suck. Like I, who wants to have that many <laughs> yes. cards in their hand? And, and so I think getting it back to the physical, getting it back to the real, assuming you're making a board game is, is, is always, is always important. Um, yeah. you're, uh, I well, mean, yeah, let me just say one note about yeah. TTS, which I think is has been a huge boon to prototyping. But I also find it a bit of a danger because it's so easy to clone elements that you if you like running out of resources, you're like, oh, I'll just clone some more. Right. But but the thing that it it becomes a bit of a danger for us game designers is ultimately these things are going to have to be physically made and you're not going to be able to have an infinite number of uh, tokens or anything like that. So, so what I've been doing is um, as I've been building in TTS, I'm also building in the real world and right. I'm trying to find where those limits are. Um, so that way I can go, all right, I, I, I can only have 15 of these tokens or I can only have 22 of these cards or whatever, because that gives me, I think it's good to have a box for game design, like uh, literally sometimes even just a physical box where you think about, you know, what are all the pieces that are going to fit into it? Because, uh, you know, as you know, as a publisher, there's this whole issue of cost of goods. Oh, yeah. And I mean, TTS is could make it go ridiculous. You know, you can you can put out whatever you want in TTS. Right. But yeah. the reality is we have to sell these things and we have to make a profit at it. And, 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 and more so as a publisher myself, I have effectively three box sizes. I have the... Um, my small game box, like box, like I guess I have four now, like Sunset Over Water, Proliferous, Herbaceous. I have my medium, which is the Whatnot Cabinet, and um, Tory and the and Sprouts, and then I have my big, which is like Skull Hollow, Lift Off, Legendary Creatures, and now I guess I have my little tiny ones that are my pocket edition ones. But typically, when I'm working on a game, like I pretty quickly into the process, I've decided what what size game it is. Yeah. Sometimes I'm like. The Whatnot Cabinet is a good game that was like sitting between small and medium, and we had to decide whether to go big or small with it. And we went to, yeah. but, but, you know, I have a bunch of white box samples, which are just literally like a white box. Yeah, exactly like that. Um, yeah, and, I, I do that. I, I buy a bunch of these kind of medium sized white boxes, and and I will build my game around this form factor. Yeah, and and it really helps because. I come in and I set down. Actually, it's funny. I, I recently sent a prototype to a publisher and I sent it to them in a box about that size. And they opened it up and they're like, "Wow, that's a lot of stuff that you managed to cram into this box." Yeah, and, and sometimes like, I mean, I, I uh, you know, not to give them a hard time, but like, you know, I, I recently did a review of Cape May by Thunderworks Games, which is in their role player size box, but it is like bursting. Like, you know, it's one of those games where you can make it. It does fit, but it's like <laughs> everything has to be in its place and like. It just, it, 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 like, if you mess something up, it doesn't close. You have to, like. Yeah, you got you to gotta give that guide, right? That little yeah. guide of all the pieces where they fit. But, yeah, I mean, you know, you you got to find that balance. I, I think overfilled boxes can be a problem, though I've, I've definitely, you know, 
the 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 one uh, 100 Tori is an example of a game that was is too full. Probably could use the bigger <laughs> box. Okay, so you don't um, need you don't need 20 of those cards, right? Just get rid of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this next step is interesting. Step four, first public prototype. I think the big question here is for most folks is like, how do you decide when it's ready to show to other people? Like, what's I, what's that line? Yeah, I, I always say when you're not embarrassed by it. Like there can still be things wrong with it. It can still not work in certain ways. It can still be clunky. And and I'll address why you can do that in a second. But but I for me and and this is I know this is kind of an ongoing debate with certain game designers. And there's one game designer in particular that we're always bumping heads about this fact. Um, but he his attitude is it just has to be good enough to communicate the gameplay. But I always go one further and I go, it has to be pretty enough to not distract the player from the gameplay. Like, like it has to look nice enough so they don't complain about how crappy it looks so they can concentrate more on the gameplay because that's what you're trying to get feedback from. You, you don't want them to go, man, your handwriting sucks. I can't read it. Or, oh, these are crappy index cards and they're all bent or whatever. Um, you want it to be presentable enough so that the conversation is about the gameplay. Oh, oh, I I I completely agree. Um, and and I I think I'm even further down the spectrum to a to to a certain extent, which is like, I think that there are many design situations which, um, graphic design or visual layout solve that allow for designs yeah. that you could do which otherwise would be annoying or too difficult. Uh, Two examples uh, of this uh, that are very similar, but both good examples were Herbaceous Sprouts. Um, Steve had sent along a prototype, uh, and he had said, like, you know, me to print out stickers for the different herbs on, on the on the on the dice. But I was like, I didn't want to do it, so I was like, I was just playing with the pips in a conversion table. So like, one pip is dill, second two pips is this, and you know, I was giving him feedback on it, and I was like, man, it was just there's so much effort to like see the dice and your herbs and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you print the, the herb dice or did you do the conversion table? And he was like, I did the convert. I, you know, I did the conversion. He's like, it's never going to work that way. You, right. It's adding this mental step that doesn't, is, is not there in the end game. Another example, because I gave him a really hard time. Um, uh, uh, Brad Burke and uh, um, um, uh, Peter, um, what's, what's his last name? Um, the guys from Cardboard Alchemy now, when they were working on Rise of Tribes, Oh, right. There was an early Brad, version. Yeah, Brad, Brad Books and Peter Vaughn. Vaughn, thank you. Uh, yeah. What I played were the the dice had pips. And like it, you were like adding, you were just doing all this math all the time, like of adding dice. And then, you know, their response to, at first was like, this isn't hard math. You're just adding like two plus three plus one. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, but it sucks. <laughs> like, But I don't want to do it. Like, I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> Why are you telling me? I'm telling you this isn't fun. You're telling me it's math. And I'm like, we agree. Right, we Right, um, and and which so, is ironic because that system is really fun. I I I've played that quite a bit, and it's it ended up really great. Well, yeah, well the the you know and and I, I give them I give Peter in particular lots of aggressive feedback because we're friends. But um, that was one where eventually they came back and they did the 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 moons and the I don't remember the moons right. and the stars or whatever. But it, it's like the math was identical. It was just like, do you have two moons or a star? And I'm like, I've got two moons. Oh it. man, I I teach all the time that whenever you can obfuscate math with symbols, uh, as long as you're not having to check back on like a major chart to you know what the hell does this symbol mean? You know, there's you know 20, 30 symbols. You don't you don't want to get into that turf. But um, but if you can, anything you can do to avoid math, I think is a, a win for a game uh, design. And, and and yeah, and and certainly certain uh, 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 designers. Uh, certain players yeah. are, are more like it, but okay. So, so, so this was an interesting step. Is you, you have the. <laughs> we definitely need to be rolling at this. Is my, uh, my computer's not going to be able to handle this file. Okay. So, step five uh, is playing with game designers. So, you have this as a distinct step between public, anybody, and designers, and you also say like close friends. You know, what is your thoughts on the distinction there from your perspective? Sure. So, game designers come to the game already with this large lexicon of games and gameplay and how things are supposed to work. So you can talk to them in a shorthand version and they their feedback will generally cut to the quick. So uh, I'm looking for fast 
and solid solutions to problems in my game design. And if I play it with, um, uh, you know, normies, right, regular uh, players, and uh, and or, or or even worse, f- friends and family who are going to say complimentary things, I don't need I don't need that. I don't need um, a lack of communication, and I don't need um, uh, you know, oh, this is such a great game, Scott, you know, but but they don't really see the problems. I need somebody who can see the problems, communicate what's wrong with it in a hopefully a, uh, a, a pleasant and, and friendly manner. You know, you always want to be polite about it and, and, and all that. But but I find that g- fellow game designers just have the the communication skills and the and the knowledge to very quickly get to the heart of the matter, because that as me, I want I want to solve it. Right. I'm, I'm doing um, in some cases I'm doing uh, uh, triage on my game. Right. And, right. and so I need to very quickly uh, uh, stop the bleeding or, you know, whatever. And, and you know, and, and there have been game sessions where I'm playing with um, uh, friends that are game designers where I've just ripped out complete systems and go, all right, let's just forget about this and keep going, and they can handle that. They can handle that kind of major redesign on, on a, you know, as we're going without really batting an eye. And so the game designers in general, I find, are just better suited to give you the information you need at that stage of the game. Yeah, one thing I'd add, and it depends on how senior you are as a designer or, or weathered, perhaps, but, um, you know, I think I think... One thing I'd caution too, though, is when you're playing with a bunch of designers, you know, very rarely are they going to be like your game's great, and they're they're oh, almost no, always going to want it to be a different game, and or somehow they want to want they want to add value. And I think the biggest challenge is like sometimes I see designs. I've, there's many cases where I've seen designers have something that I was I was like, this is 85% ready. You just like a tweak or two get overhauled because of some designer feedback when it was succeeding with players, and so. That, that isn't to say it's bad. It's just to some degree you need to, to measure it and understand that, you know, sometimes your audience isn't game designers. For, for, right. uh, in my space, that's often the case. But also sometimes your um, your game might just be different in a good way, right? So right. It, is, it is something to be cautious about. I also say that just because somebody gives you some advice doesn't mean you have to take it. Yes, that's another now, good one. You, you don't have to say it in front of them and go, no, nah, that's not a good idea. That's that's kind of bad form. But you just kind of smile and say, okay, that's an interesting idea. Write it down. And then the minute, you know, they're not looking, you cross it out and say, I'm never doing this. You well, know? you know. So you don't, have, you don't have to take all of this feedback, right? Like just because someone gives you feedback, it, sometimes it's just not appropriate or sometimes it's just not what you want out of the game. And that's and that's ultimately the, the biggest challenge for game designers is that we have to decide, you know, we're like the sieve. We have to decide what to get through and what not to get through. And, and but of course, the problem is there's so many ideas and so many ways we yeah. can go. It, it's now we're like, well, what's the best one? And you can drive yourself insane. I've I've done it many times trying to figure out which is the right way to go. And it, and it is something you will get better at over time yeah. as a designer for sure. Or you or you get a style, right? You kind of yeah, say, well, right. that's just not the type of game I'm interested in making. I'll, yeah. I want to do. I, I, I think that's a really important part is understanding what game you want and what audience you're the game you're making the audience for. Uh, last little quick example. Uh, there's a, a card. There's a little bit in herbaceous where like mathematically there's a choice in herbaceous on a certain pot where like, you know, it's, it's equivalent. You have two choices that are of equivalent value. And it was basically like, I was with a couple of designers and they went off the rails on it. Uh, and, and, and I went back to Steve Finn, the designer and I talked to him. He's like, yeah, I, he, they're right, but no one cares. And, right, and, right. and actually as a player, they like seeing it go up by one rather than me having gone up by zero. Like, it, right. like it, it made it otherwise it looks weird to the player and the player is confused right. versus oh, well, these three designers having a hard time with it. Type of thing. There's a whole there's a whole type of um, psychology that I don't think a lot of people have really addressed about ways that you can kind of fool the player. And I don't mean that in a bad way, sure. but there but like I remember um, uh, back in the days when I was doing games for the Wii uh, the Wii motion controller, you know, you, you can kind of do this with it and, and, you know, something happens on the screen. And Nintendo had uh, published a game where you had to put it on your head and kind of move up and down with it. Now, very quickly, all the fellow game designers were like, 
well, that's just bullshit. They're just, you know, having you put this on your head and, and it doesn't mean anything. And I said, but yeah, but it's part of the fun. It doesn't, it doesn't mean right. anything like you could do it the other way, but the way that the designers want you to have fun is by doing it this silly way. And so this is, this is a little bit of the hand waving that we do as game designers is sometimes we might have, we might even have redundant things that just are flavored slightly differently and they still do the same thing. Um, like I think of the game roulette, you can bid on a lot of different things, but they're really all the same when it comes to the, to the numbers, right? When you're right. looking at the, the percentage of winning, you could do red and black. You can do the yeah. numbers. What's the difference whatever. between betting it, on four or eight or three or, you know, right. There's, there's no difference, but you're giving the player the feeling of choices and you're letting them make a choice that is personal to them. And I think that that's a, that's, I mean, this is a whole nother uh, yeah, post, we, we got, blog post. <laughs> <laughs> but but the psychology of of like tricking the player, I think, is a very important step. But, but you but it's hard to do with game designers. So you save that for later on. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I, I but I do think the idea of uh, a post on tricking the the players is 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 an interesting one. So we've pretty things up. You have a step regarding get the word out, uh, which I completely. Yeah. Oh wait, wait, hold on. Did we? Yeah, we. we no, talked no, about we, didn't, we didn't really yeah. skip anything. Yeah. Okay, I was like, so getting the word out, I think you know, it's pretty straightforward, but, you know, at that prototype sale, uh, that stage, it's proto-spiels, um, you, uh, mainly, probably, there are some Discord channels and, and ways to share uh, and proto and play, like, you know, play with the fo other folks, maybe do a print and play, perhaps, maybe, yep. maybe not. Um, are there any other big categories of getting the word out at that stage? You know, to be honest, and it's, I don't know if... <laughs> This might be a violation of their site protocol. But early on, like if I'm in the stage of, of showing it at Protish Bill, anytime I have a game ready for public consumption that might have an opportunity for people to take pictures of it, I put up a listing on Board Game Geek because it does a couple of things. One, it kind of like, um, you know, it's kind of like, remember when we were kids, we put quarters on video game, you sure, know, the, sure, kinda, sure. Your, your weight in line. It, it kind of does that. It kind of says, look, I, I have a game coming out. It's called this. Uh, and so I'm kind of like, you know, it's a little bit like a very loose copyright in a way. It, it is. A, a board game geek has become more stringent in, about such things. Uh, right. uh, you, you do. They require a lot more information. And, right. and, and, and but but it, it's a good example of ways to. um there is a point where it's okay. It's just that yeah. they've gotten a little bit. It used to be like you could find a bunch of basically prototypes on on BGG, but right. Um, usually, but you it's want usually when I'm ready to sell a game because then I can go to a publisher and go, well, if you look it up on Board Game Geek, you'll see, you know, a lot of that information as well. Yeah. It's kind of like having your resume on LinkedIn. Yeah, no, no, it is. I I definitely agree. I think it's it's just you know, uh, well, you know, if you can do it, do it. But I think. They have become more stringent. Oh, so right. welcome back. We actually had some connection issues as we were rolling through the list and we had to regroup on a new day, new time. But we are going to continue along with this video, new outfits, new attitudes. It should be fantastic, right? Exactly. Um, All right. We are on. We, we had just been speaking about step seven, get the word out. And right. now step eight is more playtesting. Right. You know, at, yeah. at, so at this point, do you. Well, how is this playtesting different? Is it more? Maybe you could talk to that a little bit. Right, right. This is playtesting with, you know, normal folk. Now you're you've kind of bashed it a few times with your game designer friends and now it's ready for prime time. And so this is usually when I take the game out to protospiels or to local. There's a there's three local gaming conventions here in Los Angeles and I'll take it to that. And so this is where I am starting to get gamers of varying degrees of um, applicability. And I, I say that because a game is for a certain audience and you might not be able to collate that type of audience perfectly at a convention. There are, there are some conventions that, that will kind of try to match you up with certain types of players and things like that. But for the most part, this is kind of like open gaming. So uh, you're going to, you know, I've, I've, for example, when I was playtesting Ray Guns and Rocket Ships, which is very much a skirmishy, dice throwy, you know, a meritrashy type of game, I had, you know, very, um, uh, you know, very strong Euro style gamers that were like, well, am I, am I going to like this game? 
And I'm like, I don't know. Let's play it and find out, you know. And and so it's it's good to get the opinions of people that are grossly um, different than the target market just to see if it has any sort of crossover appeal or anything like that. And and sometimes you get some good opinions and good advice from people regardless of what their interests are. You know, people, when they are playtesting, they generally want to help. And so some people are better at communicating that that help than others. Oh, sure. Uh, but but it's up to you to be able to parse the information and and you know you, just because somebody gives you feedback doesn't mean you have to take it. I think I, I said that last yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But, and it's true. Yeah, it's true, right? It, you're the designer. You know the experience you want to create, or at least you have an idea of the experience you want to create. And so it's always best it's always best to listen to feedback no matter where it comes from you can a good idea can come from anywhere um and and then of course the the other general rule is if you hear something often enough then obviously it's something that needs to be fixed right so if people yeah. keep saying I don't I feel like I'm you know uh, I'm you know I'm not getting enough resources then then if enough people say that then yeah they're not getting enough resources now there's flukes there's there's times where things are circumstantial, and if you know your game well enough by that point, you can kind of identify them as edge cases. But I will tell you as a published designer, and I'm sure, Ed, you have the same experience, that if players are going to gripe about anything, it's always going to be about an edge case. And so you want to make sure that you are covering as much of that information, uh, letting them know that... Um, Sure, there's an edge case, but here's the answer to it. Here's how you resolve it. Because people look to rule books, uh, you know, when because you're not there, you can't explain uh, your game to them. And so um, it's always good to make sure that at least a few of the edge cases are covered uh, in a rule book, maybe by a sidebar or or yeah, you know, you know I mean, I, I found it depends on the game and the situation. But even like if 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 there's a couple just weird cases that are interesting questions that don't require tons of space. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with an FAQ in a rule book. Uh, right. Yeah. I think it's a fine way to be like, hey, there's like a couple things that are going to come up. You know, yes, you yes, technically this is the end of the turn, so that card doesn't work this way. Just right. if you ask, um, it's an interesting question. Lots of people ask it. Um, so, uh, but yeah, for sure. And and I, I think expanding your playtest groupings is 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 a big deal. Right. Um. So your next step, actually, I was surprised to see it where it was. So I, I am curious here. So, so step nine here is you have getting quotes. All right. Um, why don't you take me through why at this point you find this is the time to do that? Because you haven't gotten to deciding if you're going to publish or not. You haven't gotten to these other stages later in your in your list. Right. Why don't you go through this a little bit? Sure. So um, there's a several good – this is a, a more recent um, – thing that I've learned as a, as a designer. And that is the closer I can figure out like what the cost of a game is going to be, um, the more, the easier it is for me to approach publishers. So I can say that, look, in my own investigation, I have quoted out my game and it costs $5 a unit. You know, I've talked to a few people and, and this is, you know, by my, you know, now you're, investigation might uh, find something else out or you might find uh that five dollars you're like all right great well maybe we can plus up a few uh components and make it a six dollar game right but we still are making a profit off of it so it so it helps the publisher i, I think it's helpful information for the publisher it it you know as long as you're not saying you know, look, this is a $5 game. Well, of course, the publisher is going to take it and, and have room to run with it. And, and that's their prerogative. That's fine. Um, but the other thing that I think it helps with is it determines what I consider the minimum viable product, which yeah. is there's a certain level of the game. Where I, I'm a, by nature, I'm a um, additive designer, not a reductive. No, I'm a reductive designer, not an additive di designer. So I will start with something and I will pare it down, pare it down, pare it down until it's something that is um, kind of uh, not streamlined, but kind of humming at its optimal capacity. Right. And and game designers often have a tendency to want to, uh, you know, add features and feature creep and, and, and components. Oh, hey, wouldn't it be great if we also had this and if we also had that and 
And I find that sometimes that can get a little distracting. And so a good exercise, uh, actually, I learned this from my friend uh, Tate Wu, who is a, a really great and prolific game designer. He essentially said, look, let's let's like strip out what do you need to make this game play? And let's figure out like what that core game is. And then anything else that you've created, you can keep for like, for example, he, Tate does a lot of Kickstarter. Um, we can keep that for stretch goals or we can keep that for an expansion sure, or something sure. else. And and I found it to be a really good exercise to just take a really hard, cold look at at the game, not just from a gameplay perspective, but from a component cost perspective. And sure. and then when and once you figure that out, then you can go to the to the publisher and go, look, this is you know, this is the cheapest that the game can be. But if you want to expand on it, here's all this other content that I've created that you can add in if you're interested, or we can save it for later. And I've, and I've actually, um, uh, one of the games that I recently sold, I had done this exercise with, and I went to them and I said, all right, here's the game. And then I included like a, a package of extra materials. And I said, but if you want to publish it with this stuff, here's the rules, here's the components. This is what version 2.0 would look like. And and they really appreciated it, and I thought, awesome. and so I'm like, well, that worked pretty well. Maybe I'll keep doing that. Cool. Yeah, you know, certainly, as pencil first games, this is about the same time we would be looking at that kind of, you know, getting an idea of the components. And and actually, at this point, I I don't really send out anymore. Uh, I have enough, you know, there aren't that many components that I haven't done, so right. so I can you know sort of be like, well, you know, like an example would be like. Mall Peak is not a great example, but Mall Peak effectively is the same weight component density as Skull Hollow. So I'm like, I know how much Skull Hollow costs to make. It's going to be within 50 cents of that. So, um, but, but, you know, it's a, like we did a, a flip and write that uh, is uh, delicious, which is coming out next year. And I had, I've never, I had never done uh, pads. I don't have a game with, with, with drawing pads on it. And so I was like, I don't know how much that costs. Um, okay. So coming in at number 10, <laughs> you have uh, your rule. So uh, presumably up to this point, uh, you're really just teaching the game effectively right. with players uh, when you're play testing. But now you're going to you're suggesting to sit down and actually build out and write out the rules. Right. Well, I'm I, I mean, it's not like the real rules just materialize at this point, of course, there sure, are sure. there are earlier versions. But really what this is, is the rules that you can share with other people and start doing blind play testing with. So this is uh, this is the version that you feel confident enough in the rules of the game. You've you've corrected the major problems. You've identified the edge cases. You have laid out what I call the order of operations for the player, and you have it printed in some sort of you know, moderately visually interesting or or at least informative form. Uh, and you then feel pretty good about letting other people read it while you're not there or while you. Um, as Matt, Matt Lee Cox says, uh, shut up and sit in the corner, right? And and right. watch uh, watch them play test. Um, but, and actually, uh, if I might, I 100% yeah, agree with you. And, and and it's good that you said that. I might note that uh, the step that you described, the blind play testing, getting other people to read it, to try it, to go through the experience of playing undirected, that's what the blind is, not being taught how to play. You don't actually mention that um, in that step. So it might be worth... See, this is why you should always have an editor for your rule book, because okay. editors will help find things in your rule book that then you go, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm missing this. Let me go back and add that. No, it, it, that, that, that actually <laughs> the play testing associated with the rules is a pretty big deal. Uh, yeah. And even, you know, continually, even and even in cases, just to give an example, um, you know, we recently released Foliferous and we had done blind play testing. We had done lots of play testing at that game. But um there were a couple questions that came in from the community on um, how uh, uh, how the uh, I mean what was it how some of the um, sculpture cards work which basically you get points if you're in second or third place but if you only have it like you can't you don't get points if you don't have the card it's only like for the last place of people who have the card and like it's explained but not like crisply enough and and enough people ask that question so and we're we're doing. Uh, fortunately going to reprint um and like we've went in and been like note you must have a card to get points you know like just adding in that extra sentence um 
which we had we had uh, you know missed. I mean, it, it just hadn't come up sufficiently at the time that it got addressed, like that the language seemed like it was insufficient. But um, right, which is which is interesting because my background is I, I went to school and studied screenwriting, and and screenwriting really is an art of of saying the most you can in the least amount. You don't you usually don't give a lot of direction. You leave that up to there's many other sure. people with films that will do that. And so I, uh, by my nature, am a very terse writer. Uh, I try to write things very uh, succinctly and, and as short as possible without getting too flowery or over descriptive. But I've kind of found that when I write roles, I have to, I'll write my terse version first. And then I kind of go back through and go, you know what, there are a few concepts that need a little more explanation. I have to fight against my instinct to keep it short uh, because, again, it is possible to overexplain something, but it's also possible to miss something that you think that people are taking for granted. And, and you're not, again, you're not there to dis- to explain these things. And so you have to think of yourself as, you know, being the voice at the very least, I'm the voice of the rule book right. um, when I write my rules. And 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 it, it also helped. That's a good trick is that uh, who is explaining the rules to the player? You can make them a character in the game and 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 sure. write it in a certain language. And as long as it isn't um, grammatically hard to follow or anything, you know, like if you have Yoda explaining rules, it, then it's going to be tough. Right. It's worth note that some people like that more than others, for sure. Right. Uh, I, I don't I think it's fun, but some some folks are like, just tell me I, I can't. Handle right. I just get to the quick. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but um, but the other thing to that extent is that, you know, people often find they say, you know, writing rules is the hardest part. And and I, I generally agree with that. Um, so I find that a wait, good trick, writing writing rule, the hardest part of making a game. Oh, yeah, I think so. Wow. I think so. Yeah, I, I, because it's it's how do you explain, you know, that there's a story to how a game is played and you need to know what that story is. Now, I always start from the player's perspective and I think about like, all right, uh, what are the things that the player has kind of in their control and in front of them? And then as things go out into the table, onto the play area and, and interact with the other people at the table then then I explain it from there. Right. So I always start from you start with a hand of cards and then with those cards is going to be X. And then you're going to do Y with these cards and you're, you're going to give it to another play. You know, but I always I always start with um, when I write now, I always write uh, from the perspective of you rather than the player, partially because it's a little friendlier, partially because I find it mentally easier to kind of wrap sure. my head around that notion. But the other trick that I do for writing rules is I will record myself uh, explaining the game and then I will transcribe that. And and there's adjustments that need to be made. But for me, I mean, your mileage may vary, but um, for me, I find it a very helpful exercise to kind of get that story straight. Right. Because I've spent all this other time playtesting and explaining it to other people. And this is how I've been communicating the rules up to this point. So now I've got to take. The things that I'm saying, and and I'm I'm obviously in real time seeing success and failure with communication of my rules to players. They might go, well, wait a second, what do you mean by that? And then in my head, I'll go, yeah, that wasn't really a great way to describe it. Let me find another way to do it. So it's it's almost like your pitch. Sure. Writing your rules is a little bit like writing your pitch, where you want to be able to communicate it as cleanly and effectively, and as maybe even a little as fun. Uh, as possible. Well, so wh- why don't we use that to transition to step eleven, yeah. which is aptly named the pitch. Yeah. So named- you, you you're happy with your rules, and now you want to you know you do your one page or your elevator pitch, um, you know, which is a, certainly a, a topic a, on it in and of itself. But right. um, you know, any any highlights from this step that you call out? Yeah, I, the one of my tricks is I use. Um, Sometimes I use kind of wordplay to help me remember things in the pitch. So in uh, uh, the game that eventually became Pantone, the game, uh, it was originally called Who's Hue, uh, which is a pun in itself. And so because it was a bit of a punny title, I came up with a bit of a monomic to help me remember how to describe the game shortly, uh, very succinctly, which was it was a card game in which you create classic characters using colorful cards and clever clues. 
And so uh, having that little, uh, you know, all C words, right? A, it, it, people would laugh at that. They would find it charming. Um, but B, it helped me remember kind of the basics of the game, that it's a card game. It's about making characters with colors and clues, you know? And so um, uh, there's other ways you can describe it, right? But you don't want to get too much into the what, what the kids these days call lore, uh, but, you know, it's just story, right? Like nobody wants to hear your huge backstory of your universe and, and you know, how three million millennia ago, these two empires, whatever. I don't care about that. You You want to make sure that what you're describing is gameplay first. Always talk about what, how the game plays first, and then if you can fit in your lore or your, you know, characterization or whatever into that, that's fine. It's always good to know who you're playing. You know, if I'm playing um, uh, Fury of Dracula, well, you're, you know, you're a vampire hunter, and you're trying to hunt Dracula who is hiding around London or Europe or wherever. Um, so that tells me, you know, who am I playing who am I, you know, what's the story? Like I'm tracking Dracula and how am I doing that? Well, I'm, I'm trying to hunt him down on this map. And then you right. go into, you know, there's these cards and, and, you know, one player is Dracula. They move him around the others. They're playing cards, et cetera. Like then you go a little bit into the detail of what the, the mechanisms are and how the gameplay operates. But I don't want to hear, you know, an entire recounting of Bram Stoker's Dracula uh, when I, you know, making that pitch because it's just not appropriate. Right. No, it, and and I think, um, you know, going into okay, starting again, I think having the elevator pitch, being able to succinctly pitch your game is really key. You need to use it as a conversation starter. Right. There's the sell sheet. Uh, you know, I don't think we need to go into the whole construction of a sell sheet here, but um, you know, I think that uh, you need the business card first, for lack of a dated term. You need to you know get somebody engaged and excited, right. and um, Learning how to do that's a big deal. Uh, yeah. And I think that transitions into, you know, step 12 here, which is, so, you know, you have the game, you have the rules, you have the prototype, um, and you have your pitch, you have your, your sell sheet. Um, and then there's sort of pulling that all together, which is sort of, I guess the step, the getting ready to sell is, is, is making sure you have all those components ready to go. You right. suggest having a video and just so, ha having a little toolkit of stuff, right? Say, well, selling a game is like applying for a job. And the three things that I usually advise my game designer students to have, usually they're video game designers, but I always recommend that they have uh, a uh, business card, a resume, and a portfolio. And um, the business card is something that you can give to somebody else and leave behind. Now, I know that uh, you know to a, a younger generation, it's a bit archaic, um, but myself, I find that there's things that you can communicate. This is what the sell sheet is, of course. It's a business card. And right. it doesn't have so to answer. You see it's a metaphor. It's not yeah, a metaphor. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 um, it doesn't need to. Well, it's a resume and a, and a business card at the same time, right? It's, uh, it's it, it gives you just enough information. If it does its job right, it piques someone's curiosity, but it doesn't answer all the questions. And, and this is uh, always a little bit of a bit of frustration for me because often I'll give somebody a sell sheet and they'll be like, well, I want to know more about the gameplay. And I'm like, well, that's great because the sell sheet just did what it needed to do, which is to get you to want to ask more questions and talk to me. And so, so I, it's a fine line between, you know, how much is too much on a sell sheet. But um, for your viewers out there, if they visit my website, Mr. Boss Designs Lair, there's actually, I have about three different articles about sell sheets and the importance of them, and even some templates to help people get started. So there's a lot of good information. There's tons yeah, of I other see, great information the out now. there. I can see, yeah, there's, and, you, and even in the, this article, links to those ones, or right. posts, so links to those posts. Right, now, awesome. now the, the thing that people need that they might get a little nervous about these days is having to make a gameplay video. And, and this is, I found increasingly more often with uh, publishers, I just got done doing a big kind of pitch fest thing with probably about 30 different publishers. And the majority of them were like, great, we've got your sell sheet. We've talked to you a little bit. Now send us a video. And I'm like, oh crap, now I've got to go make videos of, of my games. And they don't need to be long. They can be a minute or two, although that can be really hard depending, like I had, a, I have a really big sprawling um, like strategy game called Xeno Command. You can see pictures of it further up in the article. And I had to pitch it in a minute. And I'm like, oh, I, I literally was like rushing through it. I'm like, I apologize for, you know, going through it so fast, but here we go. 
And, and you know, you, you try to give them a, a succinct outline, and it helps to practice, and it helps to write it down, you know, so you're, you're reading it. And you don't need to have your face on the video. A matter of fact, I think it's better if you just show the game the whole time. I mean, they'll get to know you, you know, sure, you know, uh, it, it's important to put a fi- face to a, a product. But I think in the terms of this kind of walkthrough video, um, it's important to be very short and succinct. And and so I've ex- I've put a couple of uh, examples as, as well uh, up there. One is like a very short, a little bit over a minute long video, and another one's a little longer, but it describes the basics of gameplay just so people can understand how to play. Yeah, I mean, I think getting comfortable and good at communicating in video or in camera is a pretty big deal in general. Um, I think it's interesting from there, right? You, 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 you go to this next step, step 13, which is sort of this, you call it choose your own adventure, but you sort of, you, you, there's the pitching to publishers route or there's the self-publishing route or the Kickstarter right. route. Um, and, you know, I think that, again, this is one of these categories, which I, it, oftentimes, I, to some degree, oftentimes uh, they're, they're, they're their own topics among on their own. And then just for many people, it's sort of a, it. They choose they choose both paths until one path resolves, right? Right. Um, right. You know, you, you choose the pitch path until that doesn't get you to where you want to go, and then you do the self published path. Uh, right. For for a lot of folks, I think. Um, are is there any little tidbit you'd add to that sort of thought process and what's interesting to you, or? Well, it's you know a very important thing is to not pitch to uh, the incorrect publisher. So sure. when I was going around pitching ray guns and rocket ships, I went into my local gaming store. I looked at every board game uh, company that made genre games that had miniatures in them. And I only pitched to companies that were had made games with miniatures because I knew it like now, granted, there's there might be opportunities where you talk to somebody and they go, oh, you know, we just have happily, you know, we're just um, starting to investigate making, you know, like. Like, you know, I and I, I would never pitch a game with minis to pretzel first. But but if you had said to me, well, actually, Scott, we're starting to look into the idea of doing miniatures, yeah. then I'd be like, well, let's talk. I've got some games that we can talk about. I, I, I think it's, you know, and again, this is and for, for folks who want to pitch to lots of folks, I mean, even think of it as just who do you start with? Where do you put your energy first? I mean, I, I certainly appreciate and, and and more than just for the purpose of knowing who to pitch to. uh you should be pitching in the language that the publisher, I mean, not the stroke egos, but like basically like, hey, I'm really familiar with your product line. There are right. these three games that have been really successful. I have this game that's, you know, it's all in here. You're like um, there are the folks who pitch, who try to pitch games to Pencil First Games to come out with like, oh, I have this, you know, like dark humor party game. It's like, why, why do you think like we don't. Um, right. Versus the person who's like, hey, I have this nature themed like to play blah, blah, blah. That, you know, it's very reminiscent of, blah, you know. So I think I think that also helps you um, in your initial communication with the publisher to show that you have spent at least a little bit of time understanding their product line and their products, uh, which helps right. I think uh, uh, so, make, make so them familiar with you. I've been I've been you know as somebody who has been fortunate enough to get enough exposure that I think people kind of know who I am now. At least I can I can walk into a room and not have them look at me as a complete amateur. Um, I have been taking a slightly different tact when approaching publishers, which is I have games to sell just like any other game designer. But to be honest, um, publish, I find that most publishers, they definitely have an agenda. They definitely have a a house style of game that they want to make. And, and often, even though I, I can look at their, their uh, library of games, um, not, not everything is always obvious to me as a, as an outside observer. So I've been going to publishers recently and going, look, I'm, I, I love what you make. I, you know, I played a lot of your games or I'm familiar with them or whatever, and they're very exciting and I'd love to work with you. You, you know, you do very high quality games or whatever. I'm, let's just pretend I'm talking to you right now, Ed. And, uh, and I would say, you know, what are you looking for? What, sure. what kind of game do you want to make? And you might go, well, you know, we've been making a lot of games about herbs lately, but I really want to make a game about fruit, you know, sure. and. And I might go, oh, okay, well, 
I'm, I happen to have a fruit game or, oh, I'm working on an idea of a fruit game or, oh, well, I hadn't considered that, but maybe we can talk a little bit more about what you, you know, is it a worker placement fruit game? Is it a card drafting fruit game? And you might go, well, we haven't published a, a social deduction fruit game yet. And I went, okay, great. Let's, maybe I can make something for you. So then what you're doing is you're, you're kind of hedging your bets and, and myself, it, maybe it's just my personality, but I would much rather have a better chance of making a sale than just blindly shooting off something that I have no idea whether it's going to fly or not. Sure. And, no, and, and, so, and, and those were that really, I mean, even just in the context of the relationship building, I think that's a, that's a valuable step in the process, right? Right. Absolutely. Cause this industry is about for when you do it right, it's about making friends and sure. you know, I, I'm a friendly guy and I want to be friends with everybody, you know, if I can, <laughs> I mean, there's, you know, there's yeah. certain people that well, you maybe you shouldn't be friends with, but, for but sure. that's a whole different topic as well. Well, sort of, sort of about being friends with folks, I mean, to some degree, um, you know, in your next step is just you're talking about more exposure, which, you know, to many points is just getting your game out there, getting out there, being at the proto spiels at the cons, having the speed dating on social media, right, getting to right. know folks, having it in your back pocket. Um, yeah, the Daryl Andrews, you know, suitcase of, 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 you know, ideas. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that um, guy, you know, look how many games he sells, right? He's a, <laughs> he's a monster because he's got so many games and so many ideas and he's a friendly guy. Um, yeah. So, sure. uh, so an interesting story, um, about that is, you know, the, uh, this saying that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And, uh, the, the perfect example of that was, um, I had that game, Who's You, the, the game that became Pantone. I had it in my bag, and I almost didn't bring it to the show because I was like, well, it's this little game, and it's kind of weird, and it's not like any of the other things I'm pitching, but I'll, but I'll just throw it in my bag anyway just so it's there. And I, I met with um, Cryptozoic Entertainment, and I was pitching a, a whole bunch of other games, like a, a, a Wild West shootout game and a and a dungeon crawly game and a, and a sci-fi game and a, a bunch of genre type things, which are generally the type of games I like to make. And they looked at everything. They're like, okay, these were fine, but what else you have? And I said, well, I have this other party game, but I don't think you guys would be interested in it. And they're like, no, no, show it to us. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't really think you guys don't make anything like this. I, you know, I don't, I don't know if you'd really find it very appealing or not. And they're like, just show us. Now, I wasn't trying to be coy. I was literally being honest. Sure. Like, I didn't think they would care about this game. And I brought it out, and we played a few hands of it. And uh, Corey Jones, the creative director there, was like, I know exactly the game that I would license this with. And Cryptozoic does a lot of, like, DC and Cartoon Network. And so I figured that would kind of be a good fit. And he, and he said, you know, Pantone. And I kind of took a couple of seconds and I went to art school, so I know what Pantone is, but I, uh, he, what really what had happened was Corey had wanted to make a game with the Pantone license for a few years, but he had never found the right game. And here I show up with this game all about color and making characters and sure. all that. And it was a perfect fit. And, but I didn't know that. I didn't know that Corey had been thinking about this. I just showed up with this little game. So once again, it's, it's preparation it was me throwing that game in my bag meeting the opportunities, which was Corey wanted to make a Pantone game. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and, 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 and it, it, very, uh, genius combination right there. Uh, yeah. so, so it's very smart and, and, and we've now put together <laughs> two gigantic, I, I, I'm, I still don't know if I need to do a part one and part two. I'm just going <laughs> to make one long video, but we, we've reached step 15, which is effectively Start all over again at step one. Go back and right. do it again and again and again. And yeah. um, you, and have, you, to can love have, these, the, you yeah. have to love the process, the journey of making the game and talking to people and getting them excited. And it can get discouraging. I mean, I literally have a stack of prototypes that probably will never get made. You know, they exist. They're, they're games. They're fun and playable. But they just haven't found a good home. And, and you get to a point where you get a little tired of it. And, and so as a creative person, sometimes you need to learn to just – cut bait, you know, and, and let it go. And, and, you know, maybe it will, maybe one day you'll come across somebody who says, Oh, I'm really looking for a wild west shootout game. And I'll say, Oh, I happen to have a really good one. Let, let's talk. Um, I've, I've, in, I've, I've, I've actually played that game. The one you're yeah, referring to. Yeah. But, but it hasn't found a home. So, you know, right. as of right now, I'm setting it aside and I know it's a fun game, but 
I have other games that I want to work on instead and, and get hopefully get published. So you have to be willing to kind of, you know, tuck your ego uh, and, and go, all right, well, this one didn't work out for whatever reason. Um, so let's let's try it with something else. And, you know, ideas are cheap. It's not it's the idea is nothing until you actually make something with it. Then, you know, the execution is what matters. Yeah. And the hardest part is the rule book. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. A- anyway, um, what a wealth of information and details here. Uh, thanks so much for going through it. Certainly uh, for those who want. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you've gotten to this point, you have all the information. But I, again, I'll link the blog. You can read through it. it. It's actually a pretty, it's got a lot of fun images. I make a few appear, appearances in there, which are when you post it, I was like, oh, hey, I remember when we did that. Um, but, you know, thanks so much for um, being on. And I look forward to some of your new releases as they come through the through the pipeline. Yeah. And, and to those of you watching, um, yeah, thank you for visiting the site. Make sure you check out, there's lots of other articles about games, all types of genres of games, you know, some tutorial stuff to kind of help people walk through things. And, and, you know, um, I'm very easy to find on social media. Uh, if you, uh, look up mighty bed bug on Twitter or Instagram, um, or you can reach out to Scott Rogers, uh, on Facebook. I'm, I'm always there and talking about games and I love talking about games and I'm always happy to help, uh, people with questions about the industry as I'm learning uh, my own answers. Awesome. And you do have a fantastic series of retrospectives on classic video games as well, uh, right, yeah. which, which uh, is a whole nother thing. So, all right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And thanks for being on, Scott. Take care. Stay Bye. safe. Hey, everybody. Edo here. And thanks for watching Gaming with Edo. Reviews over here on this playlist. League and Insider videos over here on this one. Subscribe. Share. All that good stuff, but most importantly, play some great games. Thanks.